My sermon today is uh, on uh, the visitation. And uh, the scripture where I, I started my study was in uh, Luke 19. But before we begin, uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray that uh, the words of my uh, mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. Father, I ask you to, to amend, to delete, or to add as, as you see fit. I surrender myself to you. Father, I pray that, uh, that the words that are spoken by me would be meaningful, would touch the hearts of your people. As we uh, contemplate your soon coming, we must ask ourselves, what shall we say when you come to visit? Father, I pray your blessing. These things I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the uh, ways of a Bible study is uh, the proof texting, or you, know, you, you let the Bible interpret itself. And, uh, and as I read this text, I wanted to find out more about this this word. Now I'm going to be reading from uh, Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 41. And when he had come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Now this happened right after the triumphal entry. I mean, Jesus was being welcomed in to Jerusalem to the courtyards as a king, as a sitting king on, on, on the back of a, a young fold. And uh, everybody is uh, almost delirious with excitement uh, to what's getting ready to happen. And right in the middle of this, Jesus begins, Ellen White tells us, he begins to whip, weep uncontrollably. And it was kind of a contrast. On one side, you have all the hosannas and everybody just uh, beside themselves with excitement. They, they anticipate some grand uh, movement of history is about to take place. And here, the one that their hopes are pinned to, they see him weeping and sobbing. It uh, caused them to, to pause, and the, the disciples took note of it. Verse 42, saying, If thou hadst known even thou... At the least in this, that day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now belong, but now they uh, are hid from thine eyes. Verse 43. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side. Verse 44. And shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave one stone upon another, because they knew not the time of their visitation. When you think about uh, what Jesus has just said, they didn't know the time of their visitation. Could that be true for us? Are we prepared for God to visit us again? In wanting to understand that word, I went to the uh, Strong's Concordance and uh, did a search trying to find every place in the Bible where the word visitation was used. And uh, there are 15 texts in the Bible, the old and the new. Only two in the New Testament, all the rest are in the Old Testament. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I went to the Strong's Concordance. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with it, it's, it's kind of like a, an encyclopedia or a dictionary. It kind of helps to understand the words. It has a Greek and a Hebrew dictionary involved in it and everything. 
in the Word, if you would like to look it up, it's uh, the number is uh, 1984. So that's an easy number to remember. Uh, you can look it up at your convenience. Uh, the, the definition of the word, visitation, inspection, investigation, the act by which God looks into and searches out the ways, deeds, character of men in order to adjudge their lot accordingly, whether joyous or sad. I, uh, when reading this, uh, they knew not the hour of their, their, the time of their visitation. Should they have known? Does anybody know how they should have known? The prophecies. Does anybody know specifically what prophecy? Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks. There was no excuse for the Jewish people to have missed that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, it should have been as plain as day. That uh, You think about uh, the shepherds, they understood. The travelers from the east, they knew. Oh, you would think that the, the theologians, the, the religious leaders of God's church would be more in tune. but they missed it. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, let's look at uh, Mark chapter 15. Verses uh, 30 through 32. Jesus is on the cross, and the, the people are mocking. Uh, they're, they're shaking their heads and, and, and saying, Save thyself, come down from the cross. In a mocking, almost sneering kind of a way. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let this Christ, let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Verse 32 is the clue. If you look, they say, let the Christ. What is another word for Christ? Messiah, the anointed one. What is another word for king? Prince. You know where you find those words? Daniel chapter 9. They knew exactly what they were saying. For those that don't know, the only two places in the Old Testament where the word Messiah is used is in Daniel chapter 9. So for them to use this word, they knew precisely what they were saying. If you're the one, work a miracle or we're not going to believe. But they didn't realize that Jesus was getting ready to work the miracle of all miracles, the restoration of man's soul. No greater miracle could be done. Our, our, our brother Bob uh, read the, the scripture reading for today in Job 31, verse 14. When God visits, what shall I answer him? Have you ever been to a court hearing? Have you ever been interrogated uh, in an investigation? And they begin to ask the hard questions. What will you answer? Now, this isn't just an ordinary judge. This is the God, the creator of the universe is asking these questions. And if you study the book of Job, you will realize 
uh, that uh, Job tried to answer, and then he realized the futility of it and basically bowed his head and covered his mouth in submission to God. Because uh, when we come into the presence of God, we realize our human wisdom <laughs> is dirt. What, what can we answer to God? Have mercy on me, a sinner. It's about the only intelligent response. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, There's a judgment going on. And it says, at that time, Michael, which is another word name for Jesus, stand up. And the great prince, you notice that word prince again, king, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble which shall never, which as, which as uh, never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So there, there's an investigation. Remember the last time I spoke here. I spoke about uh, Ezekiel in chapter 8 and 9. You can go back and read that at, again if you, if you don't remember, but uh, Ezekiel is being taken through a walk through the uh, God's temple, and he's being shown all these abominations that are taking place right in God's house, one after another. And he says, you know, if you don't think this is amazing, let me show you something even worse. And he just repeats over and over and over again. I mean, they have idols and everything right right in the holy ground. And uh, so in that story in Ezekiel, there is an angel that goes through the courtyard and, and begins to mark the people, the ones that are weeping and sighing and crying, the ones that are contrite over their sins that it, why do we why do people come to the temple because they're convict they're they're worship they're, they're convicted of sin and they want to come and and to to make amends they want to 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 uh to make things right between them and god look at uh, revelation 22:11 Everybody there? And he that is, this is uh, Jesus at the second coming, the close of probation. He says, and he that is unjust, let him be unjust and he, still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. When Michael stands up, He's pronouncing judgment. It's, uh, we're getting ready to have a visitation. The, the evidence is in, and God makes a pronouncement that uh, your, your, your fate is set. There's no longer to be changed. I want to... Uh, us to go to Matthew 22 now. We're going to, Jesus told, told a parable about a, a guest at the wedding party. Matthew 22, 
Matthew chapter 22. That fingers don't work as good as they used to. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. Jesus answered and spake and said unto them by a parable, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And he continues on and says, You know that many didn't accept the invitation. So he, he sent his servants out again to compel people to come to the wedding feast. He said, everything is ready. You know, all the, the preparations have been made. The, the, the table is set. The only thing that's missing is the guests. And in verse, uh, verse 10, it says, So these servants went out in the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with the guests. Verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there that had not a wedding garment. Now this parable that Jesus is talking about, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. So we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. So who is the king? And the king is doing what? He, he came in to see the guests. And what did he do? He saw. There was a man that had not on a wedding garment. Can you be in, uh, imagine uh, being invited to a party and, and all the clothes have been provided? That this was the custom. And this this wedding garment represents the righteousness of Christ. There are many scriptures to prove that. And it's interesting, verse 12, he says, And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither, not having the wedding garment? And what did he say when, when God visit us? What shall we say to him? He was speechless. What can you say? God had provided everything. Jesus had, had paid the price for sin. What excuse did we have? What, what could he say? He was speechless. Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence come they? And he said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said un, unto me, uh, said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, which have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We see this white robe is Christ's righteousness. The only way that we can attain this robe is from Christ. By no other means, we can't we can't uh, wear our own clothes. To this, or we can't bring our own righteousness. Our righteousness by works is of no value here. The only righteousness that will do will be Christ's righteousness. So uh, you can see why that that man in that wedding party was silent. Well, what could he say? Everything had been provided, and I showed up without it anyhow. What a shame. 
The story goes on to say that there was uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth as they cast him out into the darkness. Do you think when Jesus comes and pronounces a sentence on the wicked that they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth? I pray that none of us are a part of that. Uh, the wedding garment has been provided to each one of us. Uh, there's no reason for us to to come to this party not dressed properly. It's interesting, too, that uh, everyone found it with a wedding garment on will have come out of the Great Tribulation. Something to think about for those that think that somehow when the signs of the times, you know, we, we read in uh, Matthew 24 and other places in the Bible that talks about that there's a time of trouble coming. And some people think, well, I can go hide in the woods or I can just go lock myself in my bunker with my survival kit and just wait it out. Every one of us are going to face this tribulation, whether we're ready for it or not. Um, if we're going to have this white garment that represents Christ's righteousness, everyone that goes through tribulation are the only ones that are going to have this, this robe. So something to consider. The next place I want to go is uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 8. <coughs> this is really an amazing story. It's about a, uh, an, a lady who was an adulteress, the Bible says, and it goes on to add that she was caught in the very act. Pretty graphic description. Uh, it's interesting that in, according to the Mosaic law that to condemn somebody of a crime such as adultery you had to have at least two or three witnesses that would corroborate the statement. So let's let's go through the story. It's interesting where it takes place too that uh, Jesus went in into the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again to the temple. It's interesting that this takes place in the temple again. What will we answer when, when God comes? And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the, in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And they said, tempting him, that they might accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Did you ever wonder what he was writing? And it's interesting that uh, these Pharisees, uh, they only gave part of the, the law of Moses. Yeah, the, the law of Moses says that people who commit adultery should be stoned. Not only the woman, but those, that person who participated, where was he? Where was he? They had an agenda here, and Jesus knew precisely what they were doing. They were trying to set Jesus up because if he said, yeah, you should stone him, then he goes to, he go, they go to the uh, Roman and say, oh, Jesus is super, you know, he's taking uh, uh, 
allowances that aren't allowed by Roman law, and they can get him in trouble with the Romans. And if he says, you know, do nothing, let her go, then they say, well, he's soft on the law. He's soft on Moses, and he's, he's, no, he's no prophet. He's no Messiah. So what they're trying to do is catch Jesus in, in a, in a, between a rock and a hard place. But they didn't realize who, were, who they were messing with. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. So he's saying, you know, if, hey, if you got a clean, clean record, did you have no no sins before God? Then you pick up the first stone to throw at this lady. And you think, well, boy, they're going to think, well, this this is a great you know, golden opportunity here. You know, we're going to set him up now. And then verse eight, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I wonder what he was writing. I wonder what he was writing. Do you know that the Bible tells us? Ellen White tells us too in the uh, Acts of the Apostles. But uh, no, I'm sorry, in Desire of Ages, pardon me, Desire of Ages. And uh, But I'm, gonna, I'm going to read to you and you can read along with me. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Verses... Here, 17 verses 12 through 14. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from, the, from me shall be written in the earth. They that, depart, they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Where was Jesus writing? Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Pretty well says it, doesn't it? Do you think the Pharisees have forsaken Jesus? They rejected him as the fountain of living waters? Do you think Jesus was familiar with this scripture? He could have wrote it on parchment. He could have, he could have wrote it on a piece of paper. He wrote it in the ground for a reason, I think. And then look at verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Let's go back to, to John chapter 8. Verse 9, and when they heard it, they being convicted of their, by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? It's interesting. The law of Moses says that there has to be how many witnesses? Two or three. Jesus knew her sin. That's one witness. Where were the rest? Well, Jesus says, I condemn you not. Leave and sin no more. Because there, there was insufficient witnesses. The, the, the law of Moses said that there has to be at least two or three witnesses. Jesus understood what had happened. If you read in the Desire of Ages about this story, you'll, you'll see that 
Ellen White reveals that it was many of these men that had led her into this this life of adultery. Uh, they had set this whole thing up as she was being used as a pawn to get Jesus. And, and Jesus, when he saw her coming, he saw the fearful look in her eye when uh, he said, you know, you know, the, him that is without sin, let them cast it for... Can you imagine the, the fear that must have boiled up in her heart thinking, oh boy, this put her head down and said, just waiting for the stones to start flying. And then the next words out of his mouth is, I forgive you, sin no more. Can you imagine the, the, the joy, the relief that she experienced? When she left that place, she left with the rope of righteousness. Ellen White goes on to reveal that she led a, a pure and, and, and holy life after that. that she was so thankful for this reprieve, this, this forgiveness that she had received. Uh, how about us? Sometimes when I do Bible studies, uh, it takes me to, to some interesting places. Let's go uh, to uh, Luke chapter 10. This is uh, the mission of the, the 70 uh, disciples that were sent out two by two to, to preach the gospel. And when they came back, uh, and look in verse uh, 17, Luke 10, verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through, through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and the power of enemy. And uh, oh yeah, verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written where? In heaven, not on the earth, in heaven. Remember the other book that, that we remember that uh, Michael, our books are written in the book in heaven. So where do you want your name written? In the earth or in heaven? What robe do we need? The robe of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. I wanted to, uh, let's see here, Isaiah chapter 10. Verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, And what shall and what will ye do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from afar? To whom shall will we flee for help? And where will ye leave your glory? Without me ye shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away. What is the last few words? But his hand is stretched out still. There is God's mercy. Now, you know what I thought about when I read that? 
Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 23. Are you there with me? Luke 23, starting in uh, verse 33. And when they were come into the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, I want you to picture this. Jesus is on the cross with his arms stretched out. Who is on either side? A thief on the left and a thief on the right. Keep that in your, I want you to, in your mind now, I want you to see Jesus with his arms stretched out on the cross. Remember in Jeremiah, what we just wrote, what we just read? God's arm is still stretched out. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And then verse 39. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. If thou be the Christ, say thyself. Now again, also in verse 35, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God, every time you see the word Christ in the New Testament, it's a direct reference to Daniel chapter 9, the Messiah. They knew precisely what they were doing. There was no doubt who they were crucifying. Verse 39 says, and, and one of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us, mockingly. But the other rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art of the same condition, uh, condemnation? Now I want you to picture this. Jesus' arm is stretched out, both of them. There's two thieves, which represent the two parties in the earth, the saved and the lost. His arm is stretched out to both. One rails and mocks, and what does the other one do? Have mercy and remember me when you get to your kingdom. He really recognizes his need. He says, hey, this guy... Look at verse 41. It says, We indeed justly, for we uh, receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. He recognized his great need. He recognized that he was getting what he deserved. He knew that Jesus was a different story. Jesus was without sin, and yet he was on the cross. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. Two classes in, in the world. Those that recognize their need, recognize their situation. The thieves on both sides, were they sinners? The lost and the saved. They were both sinners. God's arm was stretched out to both, but only one received the blessing from, from the Savior. I want you to think about that. Ellen White tells us that we should spend a thoughtful hour contemplating the last moments of Christ's life, that uh, it would do well for us when you look at that picture in your mind, Jesus raised up on the cross. What's the for you? Every one of us is guilty of sin, aren't we? 
The Bible says not one is righteous, not one. That includes you, it includes me. Which thief are we? When God comes to visit, what shall we answer him? I could go over a lot more, uh, but uh, I think in uh, grace to you, I'll, uh, I'll let you go and eat because I know that you were fasting uh, yesterday and I'm sure that you're anxious to get home to the dinner table. And uh, for our visitors, uh, we have potluck uh, uh, fellowship meal downstairs. It's uh, provided for you. So uh, we want to invite each one of you to come and enjoy with us. And uh, again, please consider which thief are you today and what will you answer when the Lord visits?